Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, while we wait for everybody to populate into the room, you will soon see uh, three short poll questions that will pop up. If you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to answer those, that would be wonderful. Uh, everything is anonymous. And uh, as we move forward uh, in the program, we will announce um, the results of those questions. So thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll get started here just in the interest of everyone's uh, busy schedule. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. My name is Kathy Clarko. I'm with the University of Kingston Hospitals Foundation. Uh, for those of you joining us who may not be familiar with UHKF, as we're affectionately known, uh, we're the fundraising arm of Kingston Health Sciences Centre and Providence Care. Every donation to UHKF helps us grow health healthcare facilities, equipment, programs, research, and education for people all across southeastern Ontario. And truly without our donors, we wouldn't um, be able to offer the type of care that we can. Uh, KHSC is southeastern Ontario's largest acute academic hospital. It's important, uh, I think, that everybody uh, understands. Uh, KHSC consists of Hotel Du Hospital, Kingston General Hospital, the Cancer uh, Centre of Southeastern Ontario, as well as two research institutes. So KHSC cares for more than half a million patients and families from across our region. So for a city of our size, that's uh, pretty massive and pretty impressive. Um, as well, Providence Care is Southeastern Ontario's leading provider of specialized care in aging, mental health and rehabilitation. So we are very fortunate to have incredible facilities and access to care here. Uh, in addition to my position at the foundation, I also lead a dedicated group of volunteers and uh, we're called the YGK Healthcare Champions. So we're a group of volunteer ambassadors who work alongside the hospital foundation to encourage and inspire giving in support of the world-class healthcare that we have in our region. And a big part of the region, uh, sorry, a big part of the reason we exist is to make connections with our community, to be able to offer sessions such as today's uh, that educate and offer support. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, we are very thankful today to be joined by Nicholas Access, who is the Program Operational Director for Mental Health and Addictions Care, Care at KHSC. He'll be speaking about resiliency and offering some tips and coping strategies as we navigate through this ongoing pandemic together as a community. While everybody may be in a different boat, we're all in the same storm. And we hope today that you take away some strategies that will help you, a family member or a friend, feel a little bit lighter. So um, at the end of today's session, you will see a survey and it would be wonderful if you would take uh, a moment to complete that. This is the first webinar we've done. So we would love your feedback and, and advice. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce Nicholas Access. Thank you so much, Kathy. And thank you to UHKF. Kathy's absolutely right. Without them, we wouldn't have many of the things that we use at KHSC and in mental health and addictions care to provide services to our clients. You know, I think sometimes people think that the ministry and the government pays for everything, but they don't. And so we really rely on UHKF and your donations to help us. And we've been able to accomplish a lot of great things with that. So thank you again, UHKF. And thank you for raising uh, attention to mental health, especially during this pandemic. So I'm going to share my screen here. 
I hope everything works well. Uh, just going to get it started. So can everybody see that okay? Looks can I get great. a nod? Kathy, great, thank you. Yep. So <laughs> welcome to the Mental Health Break of Resiliency During an Ongoing Pandemic. Again, my name is Nicholas Axis and I'm the Program Operational Director uh, for Mental Health and Addiction Care. So a little bit about myself, uh, just in case uh, you don't know. So uh, I received my Bachelor's of Social Work from the Metropolitan State University of Denver and my Master's of Social Work from the University of Denver. I'm a registered social worker in Ontario. And if you might have guessed, I was originally American, but I am now a proud Canadian. Uh, I've been training and working with children, youth, and their families for over 25 years as a case manager, trainer, clinician, and therapist, both in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, I have specific expertise around GLBTQ plus issues, child welfare, child development, independent living, um, also youth who sexually offend or children exhibiting sexualized, concerning sexualized behavior, uh, social determinants of health, child and youth mental health, risk assessment, brief intervention, and suicide assessment. Uh, so I immigrated to Canada in 2006, and I moved to Kingston in 2012, where I started off at Hotel Du Hospital uh, as the social worker and the team leader for the Urgent Consult Clinic in the Child and Youth Mental Health Program. And then in 2017, I became the program manager for ambulatory mental health and addiction services here at Hotel Du, as well as social work at Hotel Du, and virtual care across KHSC. And then early this year, I became the program operational director. I'm also an adjunct lecturer at the School of Medicine at Queen's University in the Department of Psychiatry. And I've published a couple of articles on bullying, indigenous youth mental health needs, and telemedicine services and mental health. So that's the official LinkedIn page, right? But what I wanna share with you today is my personal journey as well, because I'm not just um, a mental health clinician, I'm also someone who has struggled with my own mental health and addictions throughout my career. So in this little picture here, it looks like a, a quaint New England town. I grew up in a small city called Springfield, Massachusetts, which is about an hour and a half uh, east of, uh, sorry, west of Boston. Um, when I was about 17, I came out to my parents. Uh, unfortunately, that did not go well. Uh, GLBT issues were very different in the early 90s compared to the, how they are now, thankfully, but we still have some work to do. Uh, but that made me homeless and that made me living on the street for a bit. It also made me quite depressed. Uh, I had two suicide attempts as a youth between the ages of 17 and 19 uh, due to the fact that I was dealing with so much. I had a depression. Uh, I then moved across the country to Denver, Colorado. Uh, and that's where, unfortunately, I got involved in some substance use to deal with my, my mental health issues and my depression and also just my coming out process. But Denver really helped me uh, really delve into social work and take the struggling experiences I had as a youth and use them to help others. And that's always been my passion. And then in 2006, I was able to get into Canada. I lived in Toronto for six years uh, where I further developed my skills and was able to really learn about the Canadian healthcare system and the services we have up here. And even though we like to compare uh, both places, I have to tell you as an American, Canada has a lot going for it. It has a lot more resources available to the public, even though there might be wait times. I can't tell you how many clients I had in the States that would just go without because they couldn't have the money or the insurance to access. And then uh, in 2012, I moved here to Kingston and I've been here ever since. And it's a great city to work in, a great city to live in. And we have some really exceptional services here uh, to help the Southeast win. So what I wanna talk about though, is how are you really feeling? So this is from the Canadian Mental Health Association. I want you to take a look at some of those photos. I'm sure many of you can relate during this pandemic and it's about naming it and not numbing it, right? To get real about how you feel. So the uh, Mental Health Week is coming up May 3rd to 9th. And I really like how the Canadian Mental Health Association has done a good job about highlighting this. And let's be honest, in the last 12 months, it hasn't been easy. We've all had to struggle with our emotions and our relationship to the pandemic. And many of us have been experiencing exceptional stressors and anxiety related to COVID-19. In fact, in a recent study, 40% of Canadians say that their mental health has deteriorated since the start of the pandemic. So I wanna go into a little bit about what we've learned from the first two waves as we enter this third wave. So there was, we asked some questions, again, the Canadian Mental Health Association did this survey with the University of BC and you can see that self-reported change to mental health, they looked across the country and I highlight Ontario, not just because we live here, but because it had the highest ratings out of all the provinces, right? So mental has your mental health deteriorated since the onset of the pandemic? 44% of Ontarians said that. And when we dig a little bit deeper, 
into that, what we know is that deteriorating mental health among population subgroups, 61% of those with a pre-existing mental health issue, now it's in wave one, it was 59%. So as we enter wave three, we can expect that that 61% will be even higher. 50% of those with a disability are saying that their mental health is deteriorating. And it was 47% in wave one. 60% of those aged 18 to 24, what we call transitional age youth, um, compared to 21% for those who are 75 and over in our senior community. 54% of indigenous peoples reported having deteriorating mental health. And it was 41% right after wave one. 54% of GLBTQ uh, plus people, 50% in wave one. 61% of those uh, who are unemployed mentioned that their mental health has deteriorated. And 45% of women compared to 34% of men stated the same thing. So when we talk about the pandemic, what's, you know, we can talk about wave one and wave two and now wave three, but there's also a silent wave in the background around how our mental health is being impacted. So how are we really feeling? So again, from the same study, when we look at our emotional responses to COVID-19, again, I highlight Ontario, not just because we live here, but because it had the highest rates out of all these questions. So anxiety and worry, about 53% of us are having that reaction. Stress, 43% of us. Sadness and depression, 29 and 28% respectively. And then when we start getting to some of these positive emotions, right, being calm and hopeful, we can see how we're really low at 18 and 20%. And that I think speaks to our resiliency and how our tanks are empty. Our, our empathy tanks are really low because of having to deal with this for the last 12 months. So 60% of those with a pre-existing mental health condition reported high levels of anxiety or worry. That's up from 63% in the first wave. But as well, they're also talking about stress at 57%. Loneliness at 39%, sadness at 35%, and depression at 48%. But what are we really worried about? And what's causing those emotions? And so when we, we delve deeper into that, again, I highlight Ontario not just because of where we live, but also because it had the highest ratings in the survey. People are worried about the second wave. And I can tell you that we're all now worried about this third wave that's impacting us. We are also worried about a loved one dying or contracting COVID ourselves, or being separated from our loved ones. We're also worried about vaccine safety and effectiveness, and the impact that the pandemic has had on our finances. When we experience stress and worry, we look at the subgroups and we can see that 48% of parents who have kids under the age of 18 are worried about their finances and how they will provide for their family. 51% of those with a household income less than $25,000 a year worry about finances as well. And 36% of those parents with kids under 18 also worry about losing their job, and 27% worry about not having enough food to meet their family's needs. This pandemic has really impacted us in many different ways, socially, emotionally, physically, spiritually. It's really caused us to, to really take stock of, of what's going on in our lives. So how have we been coping with that? Well, unfortunately, many times, during extreme stress, we turn to negative coping mechanisms, right? So what we've, what we've seen is that there's an increase in alcohol use, 28% in parents with kids under 18, 29% in indigenous peoples, and 30% in those with a pre-existing mental health condition. Increased cannabis use as well. We've seen a 24% increase amongst indigenous peoples, 23% with the GLBT plus community, 20% with those with a pre-existing condition, 17% with a disability, and 15% with parents under, with kids under the age of 18. And we're also seeing uh, use in prescription medication to be able to cope with the pandemic and 18% of those with a pre-existing mental health condition. And I think that speaks a lot to how we've been trying to deal with this roller coaster. So I wanna talk briefly about a story from a friend of mine in the States. And she let me know that I could share this story but she wanted to stay anonymous. So she's a good friend of mine. I've known her for many, many years. She lives in a different state than I did when I lived in the United States. And she was never a keen fan on mental health. She always would kind of poke fun at me at my job or not really understand, right, why people can't pull them out from their bootstraps and, and just move forward. And right at the beginning of the pandemic, in about April or May of last year, she started having lots of chest pains. And she went to her family doctor and said, I think I might be having some cardiac issues. She was worried because she had a family history of heart attacks. And so they did lots of tests. They did lots of scans. They did lots of blood work. And she kept calling me every week or so to say, yeah, nothing's happened. Don't know what's going on. And finally, after about a month of testing, 
uh, and lots of copays. Uh, she had to go into her family doctor's office who told her basically, welcome to anxiety, and explained to her that what she was having was a panic attack. And it was anxiety related to the pandemic. And so I say this story not to, to shame her or guilt her anyway, but she wanted me to share this because for her, in her life, she had never had a negative mental health experience. And this was her first time dealing with a panic attack, dealing with anxiety. And it crippled her. It, it, it stopped her from being able to work. It stopped her from being able to, to, to be there with her family. And she finally had insight into all the populations I've worked with in my career. And she, she said to me, she's like, I get it now. And she's like, this is really debilitating. I don't understand how people can have this every day. And I think that's what this pandemic has also done is unfortunately it's increased our mental health stressors, but it's also opened our, the eyes of the public to what mental health means and what mental wellness means and how many of us struggle day to day to make it through because of our mental health. And so I think it's really important that we understand that everybody's had a different reaction to this pandemic. All of us have, can relate to these pictures in some way or another about how we felt in these last 12 months. And I think that's part of the pandemic that will be here long after it's gone, that it will stay with us about how do we take care of ourselves during situations like this. So why is it so hard to ask for help? And so among those who reported in experiencing mental health concerns during the pandemic, the reasons they said for not accessing virtual mental health services and supports, almost half said they felt they didn't need any help. And that's like my friend back in the States. She didn't think she needed any help. She just thinks, thought that it was a pill or a scan that she had to take. And she honestly didn't know where to turn to to be able to access some, some help for her anxiety. 22% said they didn't even know that resources existed for mental health. And 21% said they didn't really believe it would be helpful. 17% preferred in-person healthcare supports and 11% cited privacy concerns. So what this all comes down to is stigma, right? And it's about how mental health is still in our society, even with all the breakthroughs we've made and all the work that we've done to destigmatize mental health, it still sits there in our community and we don't wanna talk about it. So I wanna take a brief moment to share a video with you from uh, uh, the Children's Hospital in Colorado that talks about stigma. You know that feeling where your thoughts scare you or make life tough? Sometimes it feels like no one else in the world has those thoughts and feelings. No one seems to know how difficult it is to deal with your feelings. And it's not easy to share your deepest secrets. You might think something is wrong with you. Or you might worry what other people think. And all of that makes your thoughts and feelings worse. Our culture has created this environment of shame. Until the 1960s, society sent people away if they had challenges managing their thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Over time, we learned that we didn't have to be afraid. We learned how to help people get better we became hopeful. But there are remnants of those images in our culture today, which is why some people still feel uncomfortable talking about it. The stigma has taken new forms too. With more access to more people all the time, it can seem like the world is telling us it's not okay to be anything but perfect. The truth is, everyone has thoughts or feelings that can be hard to deal with. So why do we make it so difficult on ourselves by judging others who could be going through the same challenges we are? What if, instead of seeing labels, we saw people who are struggling and could be there for them so they didn't feel so alone? What if we looked past our fear of mental health and started to talk about it in a constructive way? What if, as a society, we used empowering words and healthy images to help people feel supported? Maybe then more of us could feel comfortable telling others when we're having a hard time. Maybe more people would get the help they need. And maybe one day we won't have to talk separately about mental health and physical health, but just health. The truth is, each of us has the power to change our culture. Will you join us? Share this video with a kid, your neighbor, a friend, and help us break the stigma of mental health.
So thank you for uh, watching that video. And, and I think one of the things that I see in there all the time that I really make, I make it my mission in life is that I really do want one day for us not to talk about mental health and physical health, but to see health as one thing, that we are a whole human and that our mind and our body and our spirit are all linked. And that to just pick parts out like mental health and physical health, to really look at it as health. And to know that we're not alone, right? Mental wellness isn't all about being happy and positive all the time. It's about paying attention to your mental wellness as part of a strategy for a healthy and balanced life, which includes a whole range of human emotions. This includes some that make us uncomfortable too, like sadness, anxiety, fear, and anger. Feeling sad, angry, and anxious at times is part of being human. And it's a natural way to help us in, to process and deal with our life experiences. And sometimes we try to push our difficult feelings down, but they don't go away. They can actually manifest in other ways in our bodies and our behavior. So focusing on intense emotions won't necessarily make them worse. One of the best ways to quiet our emotions is to give them a voice and deal with them by talking about it or engaging in some healthy activities. If we ignore our emotions and we bottle them up, we can actually make them stronger or have them present in ways. A good example is not reacting to something negative at work which could end up making you more likely to yell at your loved ones when you finally get home. I've had that experience myself, difficult day at work, I go home, my partner has to deal with my moodiness because of the difficulty I had. Rather than if I had dealt with it at, at work and kind of cleared my mind before I went home, I wouldn't have to take that home with me. If your emotions are overwhelming and persistent and or they're interfering with your daily activities, then it's important to seek out mental health services. So what's important is to make mental wellness part of your daily life. So one in five Canadians experiences a mental illness or a mental health issue in any given year, but all of us have a part to play in maintaining our mental wellness. Regardless of whether you have a mental illness, our mental wellness is something that we can protect and nurture every day. Everyone deserves to feel well and understanding our emotions is part of feeling well. And emotional well-being includes recognizing what influences our emotions, discovering how our emotions affect the way we think or act, taking actions when the emotional response isn't helpful and learning to accept them. And emotional self-regulation self or the ability to label and shape your emotions is a protective factor for good mental health. The other piece I wanna talk about during this pandemic that I think hasn't really been addressed properly. I've seen some stuff on social media and the news, but. I want to be able to share with you, if you haven't heard it yet, that you're allowed to mourn your losses. For some of us, we may have lost a loved one during this pandemic, whether it be to COVID, cancer, or another disease. And we've had to isolate for funerals or mourn our loved ones without the support we usually receive from our friends and family. And grieving is a normal human reaction to the losses in our lives and can be applied to more than just losing a loved one to COVID or another illness. As humans, we really rely on rituals that help to mark the passage of our life journey. And so the grief you feel on missing out on an important event is real and acknowledged. Death is not the only thing that we have to mourn. So how many people, especially on this call, how many of you have missed out on your once in a lifetime event, be that a wedding that you've been planning since childhood, a baptism, a prom, a birthday, a baby shower, a bar mitzvah, you might've been planning these events for years or had a, a great idea of what you wanted it to be and then you had to change it because of COVID. Many of us have lost jobs we really loved or classmates or coworkers that we often interacted with, now we don't have access to them. Some of us have even missed entire years of high school, which is some of our, our formative learning years and development of our, our personality. Um, and such emotional reactions can include shock and numbness, denial and anger and fear and anxiety and panic as we process those losses. And what I want you to know is that it's okay. Um, it's, not a, it's not a competition. It's not to say that your loss is worse than mine. It's not to say that you can mourn and I can't. Give yourself permission to mourn what you missed this year and, and know that we might miss, have to miss a little more going forward, but that it's okay. And if it's important to you, if it's affected you, that matters. And it's not, a, like I said, it's not about a competition about who whose losses mean more. So how do we improve our resilience during this pandemic? And so 
what I would say is let's go for the basics, right? Go back to basics, get plenty of sleep, eat healthy and take breaks if you're working virtually. Individuals and families need to stick to routine as much as possible and provide support to one another as we deal with these social restrictions. That's how we build our resiliency. We, we need to maintain and encourage our connections to friends and family. So video chats together on FaceTime or WhatsApp or any, anything you can use, online games to play with, uh, even apps that let you connect and watch movies together. Uh, start a project that you've been putting off as a way to give you a task to focus on, especially during this lockdown, right? Finish painting that living room. It's great time to plant bulbs outside, tackle the spring cleaning project that you put off for years, uh, and then give back to others who might be struggling. Many of us are in a position where we might have the means and the ability to distract ourselves and provide for ourselves during this lockdown, but many others can't. Some might be restricted, but you can still volunteer your time or your money to those that are less fortunate that are also struggling with this pandemic. Some advice for parents and caregivers, because this is really important, because we know that our kids observe what we do all the time, and they can see how we're dealing with the pandemic, our emotions, and what we know is that structure not only works for us as adults, but it really works for kids, right? So set aside some time to spend with each of your children if you have more than one. Even 20 minutes a day of a one-on-one -on -one activity is gonna help, right? And if you don't know what to do, ask your child, right? That helps to build their self-confidence and to realize, hey, I can make choices too. So some, some uh, recommendations, and I pulled this here from uh, the World Health Organization, you can switch off the TV and avoid the pandemic overload that we're gonna hear from the news and social media. So for babies and toddlers, copy their facial expressions or engage with them in making music, sometimes with pots and spoons. I know it might be loud, but it'll be entertaining for them. Uh, for young children, try reading a book with them or coloring together or helping them with their homework. And then for your teenagers or your adolescents, talk about something they like or cook a meal together or listen to their favorite music. That might have to be some Billie Eilish or there might have to be some Ariana Grande or whoever it is, but that's okay. Let your child know that you're putting them front and center. And then acknowledge that pandemic fatigue is real, right? As humans, we're social creatures. And after a year of varying restrictions and social distancing, virtual meetings and working from home and online learning, it's normal to feel overwhelmed, irritated and tired. So know that that is okay. And that is completely healthy and normal. And with the arrival of this third way, it's even more important that we find ways to be more resilient towards pandemic fatigue and find ways to make it through this lockdown. We might feel angry, but this is temporary. As vaccines can continue to roll out and more and more people get vaccinated, we can make it through this third wave. And let's focus on the little things that we can do every single one of us that can help us get through this. And that's wear a mask in public, maintain your physical distancing and practice good hygiene. Those are the only three things you have to do. Everything else is extra, but if we can all commit to these three things, we can do our part to make sure that we reduce um, the restriction, the, the experiences that we have in this lockdown. You know what, warmer weather also makes for some more options, which is great that it's spring. The lockdown rules now allow for a maximum gathering of five people outdoors and allow for walks and bikes in nearby parks. The warmer weather provides for opportunities to increase our wellness, both physical and mental during the pandemic. So if you haven't had to already, take a chance to go to that local near, nearby neighborhood park um, or the waterfront pathway is open in downtown Kingston, as is the KMP trail, and you are allowed to go out for exercise and walks. Again, maintain your physical distancing and don't get in groups of more than five. Garden centers and nurseries are also allowed to be open during this lockdown, which is different than the first and second wave. So consider maybe starting an indoor garden or doing some landscaping outside. Maybe get those bulbs on the ground that you've always thought about doing. What we also know with mental health is that physical activity, the outdoors, and vitamin D from sunshine exposure have always been utilized as a way to improve our mental wellness. Exposure to trees and forests has been shown to actually improve sleep, lower your blood pressure, reduce stress, and improve your mood. So if, at, if anything, go out in the backyard and sit under that tree, maybe uh, get the lawnmower out, get it tuned up for the season, um, or try clean up all those leaves and we can still dump, uh, drop them off at the, at the yard waste site in Kingston. 
The other thing I want to talk about is internet-based mental health programs. These have really uh, come through during this pandemic and, and have grown and evolved as the pandemic has um, evolved, but also as we become more in tune with our own mental health. Think back to my friend that I talked about who experienced her first panic attack. She actually used one of these services, similar type of service in the States and it worked really well for her. But there's four in particular that come in mind. There's Ability CBT, uh, which is from Moreau Chappelle. That's an internet-based uh, cognitive behavioral therapy program. Mind Beacon is offering free mental health support for Ontario residents that are dealing with stress, anxiety, depression, Together All, which used to be known as Big White Wall, uh, is a website that provides an anonymous and safe place for people to find relief for mental health pressures with professionally trained and registered moderators available around the clock, and it's free for Ontarians 16 and up. And then Bounce Back is a free skill building program managed by the Canadian Mental Health Association. It's designed to help adults 15 and up to manage their low mood, mild to moderate depression, anxiety, stress, and worry. And you can get it either over the phone or through online videos. So I know that Kathy's going to make these available afterwards, but if I, I would encourage you to check these out if you feel like you might be in need of some support. Some other resources and, and supports I wanna also make you aware of is we've got some really good phone lines across Canada and locally to help support mental health and wellness. So Good to Talk is a great uh, toll-free number for people aged 17 to 25, again, that transitional age youth category. Um, some of these services also offer text and web chat for example, Kids Help Phone for kids aged 5 to 20. Uh, you can call by phone, web chat, or text. Uh, Hope for Wellness is for all Indigenous peoples. And then Talk for Healing is for all Indigenous women. And then LGBT Youthline offers confidential and non-judgmental peer support for GLBT plus youth, and also have a text and a web chat option. There's also referral lines in Ontario for you to get access to services and know how to get connected to them. So Connects Ontario is a great website that provides referral information on mental illness, substance abuse, and gambling. And they have a toll-free number, a live web chat, or email. Also, 211 Ontario is also a great website to learn about what mental health resources uh, exist in Ontario and specifically in our region. So you can call just 211 or you can access them by phone, web chat, or email as well. There's also some great crisis lines, both locally and, and provincially. Uh, and nationally. So addictions and mental health services right here in Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington have a 24-7 crisis line for Kingston and Frontenac, and then one for Lennox and Addington. You can also check out their website with some great information on what they offer for services here. Telehealth Ontario also has a toll-free number you can call, and they also have a website you can check out. And finally, the Canada Suicide Prevention Services is available 24-7, and they also have texting available 4 p.m. to midnight. So please feel free to pass these along or share these with others if you need to. What I wanna say is that before we get to the question and answer part of, of this, I just wanna talk about how it's hardest at the beginning of the end. Um, and I think when we saw the vaccines coming in, in earlier this year and with the rollout, but now as we're into the third wave, even before its arrival, we were struggling with the ongoing restrictions, the pandemic fatigue, and we were really looking forward to the vaccination starting. And even though vaccines are part of the solution, the next three months is going to be instrumental in helping us get through the rest of this pandemic. And as with many things in our lives, it's always hardest at the beginning of the end, especially when we don't know how long the journey will last. And so we can see the hope on the horizon and we can see the light ahead that tantalizes us with a possible future of no restrictions and the pandemic being in our rearview mirror, but it's gonna take all of us working together and supporting each other and each other's mental health to protect ourselves and our loved ones as we get through this pandemic. So thank you so much for listening to the webinar. I wanted to make sure we had enough time at the end to go through some questions and answers from all of you who are attending, because I'm sure we, we each have our own personal experience, our own personal question and, and the best way to kind of resolve that. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, and I'll turn it back to the UHKF team to see about getting some of those questions. Great, thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, if anybody does have a question, uh, you can use the raise hand feature, uh, like with technology, uh, the actual Q&A or chat section didn't want to work properly. Um, so if there are um, any questions and you want to raise your hand, hopefully we'll be able to see that. Okay. Um, 
so I'll wait for those, uh, some some of the folks working kind of on the, the back end might be able to see some. Um, but Nicholas, maybe I could um, put forward a question because as we were doing this, some things were coming through through social media chats and whatnot. And uh, one of the questions that was asked, um, and you did speak to it a little bit, but uh, staying home with my family members um, is challenging and I'm irritable. Yep. It may have been me that actually <laughs> asked this question. Um, but how do I keep my mood in check um, without fighting with everyone? That's a good question. And you know what? That's happened to me too. Um, it's not easy. We're very social creatures. We love to have contact with our friends and our family and travel. You know, let me pop over for a coffee or let's go out to a patio uh, for a break. Um, I think what's really important is that with your loved ones in the home that you really just talk about like, look, there are going to be times where I might feel super frustrated. I might feel as though I'm going to say something I might regret later. So let's come up with some strategies now on how to avoid that. So if I tell you, I need to go for a break, that should be your cue. Just leave me be for 15 minutes. And so maybe that means, you know what, perfect time to go for a walk outside because we could get exercise. Uh, if the weather's not good, if you have another room in your house you can go to, like a basement or a bedroom, maybe it's about just going in there with a book or even going in there and doing some deep breathing for about 10 minutes, right? Even doing some backwards counting until you can calm your mood down. But the key part is communicating with your loved ones to let them know this isn't about you haven't done anything wrong. It's about how I am reacting to this situation. And I know that I don't want to make the situation worse. So I'm going to step out for a few minutes to calm myself down, to recenter myself, to have some alone time and then come back. Now, I know that might be very difficult for parents who might be an only parent with young kids and you don't want to leave them unattended, right? So the best way to do that is maybe do an activity together that distracts your kids, right? Put on, you might have to listen to Frozen for the 17th million time and I'm sorry, but put Frozen on, have the kids entertain while they're watching. Maybe you can sit back on the couch and do that deep breathing or do an activity together that might distract them. Uh, but it's really important to communicate. I think the hardest part of this pandemic is that we're not mind readers. We can't, we don't know how everybody is feeling. So it's really important that we're just clear in our communication and set up those boundaries a little bit ahead of time. So people know that when you do take a step away, it's not because of anything negative, it's just because you know you need a break. Right, that's a great answer, great, great tips. Um, another one that came through, um, through uh, Facebook chat, uh, so many things have been canceled, my graduation, and I'm laid off from my job. These things are very heavy. Any advice on how to cope? They are heavy. heavy. Uh, and and I, I feel for everybody. I've had to, I've had some cancellations too. You know, I haven't seen my parents in over a year because they live in the States and I can't cross the border. Uh, it's difficult. And, and I think what's important is that we acknowledge that and we acknowledge that it's difficult and it's okay for you to feel that way. So how do we get through that? So some good ways of doing that, I've always been a big fan of journaling. Many people are not, you don't wanna sit down and write down words, but sometimes it can be very freeing to be able to write down all of the frustrations you have, all of the anger you have into a piece of paper and then safely get rid of it. So that might mean, you know, tearing it up to, into a million pieces, lighting it on fire safely, uh, but, but doing a, uh, almost a, a, a ritualistic way of kind of cleansing yourself of those negative thoughts. I know that might sound simplistic, um, but it's one way of doing it. Another way is about talking about those things. If you have a good friend you can confide in or a loved one you can confide in, talk to them and just say, look, I need to vent for a little bit. I'm so angry that I lost my job or I'm so frustrated that my mom can't see their grandchild, right? It's been so many months. It's okay to find someone that's a safe space for you to vent and get that out. Because remember what we talked about earlier, when we push those emotions down and we don't acknowledge them, they're going to come up in other ways. So it's about finding a release valve to be able to let, let that feeling go so it doesn't sit with you. Right. Great. Um, and I think we probably have time for one more. And I do apologize. We're not seeing um, anybody if you have a specific question. So um, my apologies for that. But this is also another really good question. Um, I feel anxious and having difficulty focusing and getting anything done. How, how do I adjust to a new routine and keep my motivation? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, Especially as our routines have to keep changing with lockdowns and, and everything. I, I always uh, would tell people I did work with that it takes 21 days to make a, a new habit feel like you're used to it, right? 
So you can't expect that everything will change in a day or two, right? When we're dealing with our anxiety, when we're trying to learn to cope with our feelings and emotions, it's about consistency and it's about practice and it's about making sure that we get used to that routine. And then after a couple of weeks, 21 days, usually most people find it a lot easier to try those new methods. I always used to tell people uh, when I would do cognitive behavioral therapy, right? When, when we let ourselves get anxious and angry and we kind of live in those emotions, I call those my comfy sweatpants, right? We put those on because it, we're used to it. We're, we're comfortable with it. But when we try and do something different like breathing or you know, trying to see, is that, a real, is that a real thought? Does that really have proof that I'm feeling that way? It feels uncomfortable, like a, a new pair of jeans, right? You know how tight and, and, and tough they are to get on? But what happens after about two or three weeks of wearing those jeans? The, you break them in, they get comfortable, and pretty soon they're just as comfortable as the sweatpants, right? That's your new, the new neural pathways being made in your brain, right? The new way of doing things. What I say to people is it's okay to backslide. It's okay to have a day where you want to get into the comfy pants. As long as the next day you go back to your jeans, right? That's the thing. It's not easy. And there will be days where you might falter or you might fall backwards and go into an old pattern of, of doing things, but that's okay. You're human. And that's part of uh, how we grow and evolve in dealing with our mental health, as long as you get back on it the next day. Great. Great. Okay. I like that analogy, actually. It's, uh, it resonates. Very good. Um, so we're coming to the conclusion of the time that we have together. Um, so again, thank you so much, Nicholas, for your time and tips and um, advice. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, at the end of the um, call, there will be a survey. And we would, again, really appreciate if you could fill out the survey. There is also a... Um, text to donate uh, that we've set up. If you are interested in supporting mental health in our region, that would be appreciated. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, uh, UHKF and the YGK Healthcare Champions team uh, to follow what we're doing, upcoming events. And um, thanks again for joining us. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.